in which the audience is invited to ask questions. We will provide you with the technical instruction on this later on. So, without any further ado, I pass now the floor to my friend Roberto, who will introduce uh, Maurizio a little bit and then start with our first question. Please, Roberto, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. As you already said, Maurizio is National Secretary of the Communist Red Foundation Party. He has been recently elected. It's been a few years now. He's been active in the world of different social movements, student movements since the late 1970s. He's been active in various ecological movements and historical battles like the one against the installation of nuclear missiles at Comiso Air Base in Sicily. And he was also elected to Italy's Chamber of Deputies in 2006. And as you know, he was briefly working in Parliament, which uh, dissolved in 2008. And in the same year, he was elected to the Regional Parliament of Abruzzo as the most voted candidate of the PRC. Now let's go on with the questions that we would like to ask Maurizio. The first question is on this historical track. How are you going to understand the history of this movement in Italy, which has been a reference for decades for the whole left in Europe, both in terms of theory, political theory, and political practice. What do you think is the reason behind its decline? And how do you think it can be relaunched in our country? Well, historical reasons are quite complicated. Some of them can obviously be identified. In Italy, we used to have the strongest Marxist left in the Western world. I remember that in the 70s, there was the strongest communist party in Italy in the Western world with a very strong social group, which was quite conflictual, actually. We also had a socialist party, which was not the same as the social democrat parties in Northern Europe, because it had different features. It, had, it was closer to communists, historically, and it had a Marxist approach. Socialists in the 80s influenced it. And then afterwards, after the socialists were guided by Kraxi, the ex-communists after 1989, with the decline of the Communist Party of Italy, they all became neoliberal strength. And basically they led to policies which somehow transform our country not in favor of working class of course. <laughs> the cultural shock that was implied by this is the root of today's weakness of the left in Italy. I remember that during the last elections in Italy among the manufacturers and workers, the first two coalitions were Lega Nord, Northern League, which then became just League, Lega of Salvini, which is the extreme right wing, and the Five Star Movement in Questelle. This was a transformation, and we as Communist Refoundation in 2000 tried to resist to this, going against these trends. And this is the second reason, I think, behind our difficulties today. That is, we were shaken by these mechanisms of bipolarism. By that, I mean that public debate was more and more polarized starting from the 90s between a central left that seemed like 
a democratic coalition with values of tolerance and anti-racism, protection of civil rights, and then a right wing with Berlusconi, which was dangerous because of its corruption, its relationship with mafia, and then with Salvini, a right wing which is strongly racist and xenophobic. This polarization deleted the reasons behind a strong left, which represented the working class in Italy, and also the protection of common goods, of the social state, and the rights of everyone. So this is the current situation we're living, which is made even more dramatic in Italy, because we are targeted as ex-communists. And against this backdrop, we are more similar to Eastern countries compared to other Western countries. And this is very sad because Italy used to have a tradition of socialism and democratic communism, which could be able to, to cope with the impact of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union without having to change like it happens. Uh, thanks, Maurizio, for this. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm coming from Austria and uh, obviously uh, Austria and Italy share the problem of the existence of a strong and dynamic far right. So I wonder how would you characterize uh, the far right party, Salvini's party, and on the other hand, um, what do you think, how the left uh, can cope with the challenge of the far right? Which strategy would you suggest to employ in the struggle against the far and nationalist right? Well, Italy in particular, in its background, has a very strong historical event, which is the fascism. Fascism was invented in Italy in the 20s, as you know, and it was basically a burden. And only with the bombs of our allies and with the loss of the Second World War were we able to get out of it. So this is something that is in our historical memory. And it's an element that pushes left-wing people to support democratic parties and coalitions, even though they do not um, share their policies. We still have this ghost of fascism haunting us. Now we have a, a, a right wing that renovated itself. And Italy is quite similar to Trump's situation in the US, meaning that in its appearance, it seems like it's anti-system. It's renovating and it represents the power of the central left. But the reality is that our right wing has neoliberal features. But we need to be careful. This is not perceived at the population level. I believe that we can tackle these trends effectively in two ways. One way is that from the US to Italy, we are using moderate strength of center left. So we're trying to attract the center and to convince the capitalist movement to trust a more responsible center left instead of the right wing that now we call populist. I believe that this solution, the one that led to Biden in the US and which gave to Italy the power of the PD, the Democratic Party, which is a coalition against the right wing. I think this general solution is not a threat to the cultural basis of the right wing. It does not 
impair its political trend. The right wing was able to stabilize the most arrogant right wing trend and the popular sect, both belonging to the working class and against immigrants seen as a danger. And you know that Austria also is seeing this trend because political discourse is very similar to Italy. And the role of the government, taxes, fiscal movements. So our mindsets are always the same as many years ago. The ones that the US uh, basically founded and that we are copying now in our country. I believe it is fundamental to cause a crisis to them and to threat the common consensus that the right wing is having on the population. But to do that, we need to give some clear, valid left wing alternatives. And with that, I'm not talking about extremist ideas or particular ideologies. I'm trying to think about moving the public debate on other priorities, other lines. Of Just an example to make you understand better regarding Europe. If you have problems and you think that the main cause of these problems is immigration or too many taxes by the government, then it's easy that you go with the extreme right wing, of course. But instead, if you convince yourself that there are actually hundreds and hundreds of million euros which every year ends up in tax havens, which could be spent instead in jobs, welfare, education, and our societies, then you actually get mad at millionaires, you know? So our test, I think, should be change this mindset and the agenda of discussions in politics in our country. Of course, that's very hard because we're talking about countries that um, are owned by the media and media's owners are not interested in focusing on left-wing topics. Thank you, Mauricio. I'll just add one last thing to be clear. Salvini became very strong in Italy together with his ally, Meloni, ex-neo-fascist party representative. Well, they changed names. These are still the same people. They are now sovereign. And with that, they were supported by the media of the left wing. And they actually let us believe that these people are defending Italy from external enemies. Then what happens is that when multinational companies are threatening jobs and little realities in Italy, the so-called sovereignistics are always defending these companies. So we either have a left wing that makes this contradiction clear for everyone, and we should show people that these are just very dangerous extreme right-wing representative, or they'll be able to have a popular reputation, which is not what the truth is. Thank you, Maurizio. And you actually made a hint about the question I wanted to ask you, which is now that we have this COVID crisis, we're living this COVID crisis, and it seems that somehow we are recognizing, well, at least most people are recognizing the importance of the public health system, and they're recognizing healthcare staff as heroes. In many cases, we're talking about women, so we are actually reevaluating the role of women in society. Do you think that this great earthquake 
and this new perception that we have of democracy. Do you think this could go against austerity policies and neoliberalism? Well, yes, I think it's potentially possible because, of course, at a mass level and um, mainstream information, it was clear that the 37 billion euros cut in the last 10 years to the public health system implied huge damages. But we need to be careful because, as I always say during our meetings, coronavirus will not uh, do a revolution for us, you know? What do I mean by that? While if we talk about mainstream information, everyone admits that it was wrong to cut costs to public health. The central left and center right, together with the observers, are avoiding another key element, and that is destroying the public health system in general. So today, we have this result. The region with the highest number of infected people and deaths, which is Lombardy, which is also the region where there was the strongest process of privatization of the public health system. So be careful, Lombardy is the richest region in Italy. It's one of the richest regions in Europe. So there was no lack of resources in general in the Lombardy region as it happened in the rest of our peninsula. The truth is the resources were actually redirected towards the private system, thus destroying public health. Now, the region led by the secretary of the Democratic Party last year is that more than 50% of the public health expenses is targeted towards private sectors. That implies that in the battle between centralized and center-left, this key element, that is, the centrality of the public health system, the national health system, never emerges. The only thing we talk about is expenses. And by that, we run the risk that the increase of funds for the public health will further increase and improve the market of private sectors. And with that, I think we need a favorable, we have some favorable territory for the conflict, and that's not good. We are also talking about the rights of workers, of health staff. In the public, in the Italian public health, we have very strong processes of privatization. And we're not only talking about the part that became private, but the public sector itself is externalizing services. We're making services external. So even sterilization of tools in hospitals is managed by private companies. And it's not done by public workers of our national system. So there is a real battle here, and I think the health staff are proud enough, and the population really appreciates them, and that could be a key factor to relaunch the protection of the public sector in Italy, because in the last 30 years, we've listened to the fact that the public sector was not efficient and that we needed a private sector, but during this pandemic, what did people experience, actually? That it was the public sector that actually helped us with the pandemic, not the private one. So from this point of view, we have the right condition to finally fight for them. We were very alone during the last 20 years, but now we're no longer alone. Let's talk now a little bit on, on, on Europe. Uh, when the crisis, the COVID crisis arrived in Europe, 
uh, many people had the impression that the European Union uh, was stuck in a sort of agony and uh, it were mainly the nation states, the member states of the European uh, Union who played the major role in coping uh, with the pandemic. But since the financial and infrastructural means uh, which the member states of the European Union can apply are very different in scope, um, the pandemic seems to have accentuated the differences in Europe. And I wonder now, uh, did uh, this uh, crisis and uh, the way in which it was not addressed by the European institutions change the attitudes of the Italian people towards the European Union? Well, at the beginning of the crisis, the European Union actually did not act very good and lost kind of its reputation. It was very unpopular in Italy by then because during the first week of the crisis, the news that we got from there were that our neighboring countries, the allies of the European Union, were hindering the arrival of face masks and gloves and other tools while these other aids were arriving from China and from Cuba. So you can imagine that there were some surveys showing how China was the main partner and the most popular ally among Italians. And I think that's positive actually because of course I was worried with the American plans because they're always planning new wars and more for European cooperation, of course, but you know, with all the countries of the world, including China. But now we are seeing quite a different situation because media are telling us that we're going to receive a lot of money from Europe, apparently. Therefore, at least part of the population is hoping that that's true. And I guess we're, we're trying to trust them and observers are underlining that this time the European Central Bank is actually intervening by supporting our country in purchasing assets. So I think there is some mixed positions of expectations towards European Union. From my point of view, I must say I'm a bit worried because I'm afraid that the slogans and autos are not completely true. If the European Union actually wanted to prove us that they could be real supporters for all the countries that belong to it, it should have used the ABC with more certainty, not only for the purchase of assets, but for an immediate intervention of financing and funding for the measures facing the economic crisis. That would have been an actual turning point compared to what the previous year <clears throat> and austerity and the growth of the inequalities between northern countries and southern countries in Europe, not only southern, of course. But right now, we're still not seeing that. Even today, right after lunch, I was watching this TV show with an Italian historic, which is close to the Democratic Party, ex-communist, and he was explaining that now we are receiving the Marshall Plan from Europe. And I'm afraid that this won't happen. We are expecting measures which will keep the spread under control and we are demanding reform today the European Parliament's president without specifying which reforms they're talking about because he didn't identify them. He declared that if Italy 
wants Europe's money, it will need to have people. So the last time this happened, we had 37 billion euros to the health system. I want to remind this to those who are listening. This part, as our representatives said during the GUE, the cut of the expenses of the public health was a measure contained in all recommendation letters from the European Commission and the European Central Bank sent to Italy. And we also had the pension scheme reform, which was even worse of the one that caused revolutions in France. People are going to retire at 70 in Italy. So you may understand that Italians now, when they hear that Europe is proposing reform, they never think about something positive for themselves and for their future generations. So I believe that the European Union really needs to go from models to facts, from solidarity to actions. But right now I'm quite confused, as I believe everyone else is. I, need, I think we need to be able, in every European country, to give some unifying models like the one of the Euro European Central Bank Convention to build European people's unity, which today we do not have yet. Thank you, Maurizio. I think you partially answered my question, but after months of absence of the European Union. Now it is planning this, well, it seems like it's planning to offer these resources to tackle the COVID crisis. And for the first time, there is a European plan. So we are establishing the role of, not only the political role, but only the economic role of the union to support states. What do you think about the plans presented by the European Commission and the Parliament? Well, our opinion is that these plans are still not sufficient, at least for what was declared by its promoters. And I think they will also come quite late. Look at the estimates from the IMF regarding Italy. They say that will be the country that will have the strongest GDP decrease in 2020 in Europe. And we are not expecting the right resources from these measures that are necessary to tackle this emergency situation. I believe that we're very worried. An Italian economist who is very popular and posted on the Financial Times together with other economists, Miano Brancaccio, he recently participated in an interview and he was very worried about the features of this crisis, which won't be a V crisis, a so called V crisis. So we do not have many hopes to, to recover the fast from the economical point of view. So honestly, our judgment is that these plans are insufficient. The European measures are not enough. And I believe our opinion does not only come from the Divisograd group attitude and the right-wing government here in Italy we call them the so-called frugal countries, modest countries. I don't know how do you call them in your country, but I think there is a responsibility to admit from the capitalistic establishment, both in Europe and internationally, that we need more public expenses. 
and at the same time they do not want to stop the governance tools that they've been using in the last 20 years to regulate our societies and force us to accept the neoliberal policy. And I believe that's the main reason why we didn't want to use a fast tool like the ECB's intervention or the recovery fund. And of course, we'll need to discuss the details about the recovery fund, but it still requires very long timing compared to the direct um, European Central Bank's intervention. Uh, I remember that in the United States or in the UK, Central Bank's intervention came months ago to fund government measures. And now we're still discussing about a plan that maybe one day will be carried out. I don't know how you can understand this, but I think you, you know what I mean. It's a huge difference. And, and Christian Bratti, an Italian Swiss economist, said this, there is no danger in the increase of inflation. And that's an accused upon which the Maastricht mechanism went on years ago. But today, with such a huge GDP decrease, I believe no one, Walter is also an economist, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I believe no one will be worried about the increase of inflation. So I can't understand why, if they said let's block the stability pact, if they said let's estimate how much we need on secondary market, let's buy assets, and why didn't we take a further step saying, you know, the ECB can immediately fund the measures? I think it's a political issue, and I reckon we need to raise this question in all European countries at the same time, because it's a position that also destroys the right-wing topic and the so-called frugal countries. And it will lead us towards a new European deal based on welfare, based on rights and environmental reconversion, which can unify everyone. I think these are political questions instead. And I keep thinking that Europe shouldn't continue to support military growth. It seems like there are no rules regarding that. Why are we not tackling this emergency situation? I'm also talking about education systems because it's evident that to guarantee safety at in schools, we need to have less crowded classrooms, so we need to hire more teachers, we need more spaces, so really about money. And why are we not facing the environmental issue? So as a European left, we really have a huge space to unify European people, whereas neoliberal issues are keep dividing us. Yeah, thanks for, for this. Uh, I think you made a very important point by saying that uh, we tackle now the COVID crisis and we are at the onset of an economic crisis, but behind all this still the environmental crisis is looming and uh, all political forces have to address this question. Uh, so uh, my next question would be, uh, what does the mean for the strategy of the left on the European level, uh, which kind of cooperation you think is necessary, which alliances is uh, your party trying to establish, and generally speaking, uh, what's the role in your national strategy uh, which uh, the uh, European alliances and forms of cooperation play?
Well, at national level, we're trying to unify all possible powers and individual strengths, which form the anti-capitalist and environmental left wing. But especially, we are trying to give a contribution to independent social movements, starting from the current priorities, that is education and social income. If we are receiving realistic data regarding the layoffs that we are going to see, you know, in Italy there is a block of layoffs right now. There is a law that it's that it's avoiding and vetoing layoffs. But now for hundreds and hundreds of workers, they were already fired. And then there are small enterprises. But this crisis will also tackle great companies. So precarious employees are already fired. We need to have a possibility for a basis income for everyone. And it is fundamental for us, for the education, the health system, the jobs. Right now we are tackling a crisis in Italy while discussing once again about how to decrease environmental checks and verification. And we're also we're also giving free way to mafia. These are Berlusconi's recipes, so to say. So the face is faint, but the topics are always the same. We should further protect precarious workers. Confindustria Association is demanding to eliminating the national job contracts. So we're working for a social alternative. And most of all, at a national level, we're trying to convince the left-wing sectors who, which are afraid of the left to tackle their fear because the idea to, to be locked down in the house, of course, will give squares and spaces to the right wing, you know, that means that the right wing will be able to have protests in the squares of Italy all over. So our job now is targeted toward the possibility to have squares and spaces planned proposals for the left. So to underline social needs. At a European level, I think we need to do the same thing and strengthen our cooperation among uh, radical left parties of Europe. Actually, the left in general, I would say. Socialist European Party, I think, is not giving any signs of strength right now. The European left is heading towards unification of this battle. We were saying that regarding the strikes for pensions in France. For us it was very important because it was the first time that we saw a great neoliberal reform that was blocked by the population. In all European countries these reforms were approved because they were presented as laws to which you could not oppose because there were economic laws that made them necessary. I think we need to be able to develop action days as a party, also at EU level. We need to develop campaigns to give the idea that we're all asking the same thing in Europe, in all of Europe, and that that thing that we're asking for is possible. I know it's really hard, I know it's hard, especially for some countries, but I think we need a unified battle against tax havens. The dumping is a real problem, and 
we finally perceive it, even in Italy, during the COVID crisis, we were able to understand how all big Italian companies have their headquarters in the Netherlands or in Ireland. I believe this is a battle that we need to carry out all together, maybe on the same day. And we also need to work on We need to work with our trade unions and our social movements to recover our roots, the roots of our working movements, which was founded in Europe as a European movement already. It was an international association of workers. It was quite of the European left. And today we need it more than ever. We need it more than 150 years ago because if we're able to do that, I think our rights will be protected and our voices will be heard and we'll be able to have some consensus in our countries. And we'll also be able to unmask the conflict among populations and countries that the right wing promoted and are feeding. We are investing all of our energies in this. Some people are criticizing us for that in Italy the left wing keeps saying, you know, we need to break up with Europe. But we do not agree with that. We don't think that the European Union of Maastricht and of the treaties is Europe. As European left, of course, we criticize the European Union. And we, as a recommendation communist party, declare that we were the only party voting against the European treaty. But we never did it. It, as a nationalist attitude. We did it saying that the neoliberalism in the treaties would have divided Europe. Today, the call to face a challenge to go against nationalism. And it's hard to do that if we do not have a big left European movement of all workers in Europe. So I think a common fight is awaiting us, which forces all European left parties to take a further step towards cooperation and pressure, why not? And also towards political work and movements and trade unions to mobilitate European forces on a, in an actual European platform. It's a dream. Walter could you imagine, and Roberto, could you imagine if the European Central of Trade Unions organized the European strike to demand the European Central Bank to change function and to promote welfare, jobs, and the Green New Deal in Europe? Could you imagine that? Everything would change. The whole discussion would change. Thanks for that. Rebecca agrees. Thank you, Maurizio. I think we're done with the interview from me and Walter, at least. Now let's give some time for the Q&A session from Giuseppe, who collected some questions in the box. Please ask all your questions for those who are listening. So I'll give the floor now to Giuseppe to collect these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for giving me the floor. Okay, so I collected a few questions in the box. Of course, I invite participants to ask other questions meanwhile, so we'll be able to ask them to Marita during our discussion. So the first question is, the right parties have an internationalist attitude and they know how to manipulate networks. Don't you think we need a marketing, a digital marketing action which could contrast the super activism of the, of the propaganda? 
and there is a second question related to this. Is there an intention from the European left wing to develop a more efficient communication to eliminate the toxic narrative of extreme right wings? Well, these are very important questions. I remember that in Budapest, during a session of the European Left University, we participated in a forum about these topics and together with some expert colleagues, uh, expert in communication and networks. I think this is our current situation. We have some very weak parties, extra parliament parties like ours, which do not have enough resources. And we have other parties which are stronger and have enough resources, but work in their national space. So as the European left, we would need to invest in something similar to the communication machine that the right wing are using. We know that in Italy, Alvini's coalition together with Giorgia Meloni's coalition, when they opened this relationship with Bannon, they actually took a, a step forward, a huge step in their ability to uh, increase numbers. We're talking about millions and millions of contacts and the public opinion, especially less cultured, late piety, less educated people. You know, they're more, it's more possible to influence them and I'm including young people uh, among them. I think and this is a, a cry of help to stronger coalitions. And this could be also a strategic discussion uh, within the European left. We really need to create a pool of experts. And I think we, need, we have a lot of those. Because if, if we have money for communication, for networks, and to you know, involve experts, those with the brain, so to say. There are a lot of people who have our same opinions, and we, as a European left, really need to build a project by inserting these skills in our network. Salvini says that he has a beast. That's how he called this consensus machine. So we need. You know, the beauty then, the beauty against the beast. We need to create something that corresponds that, but with positive messages, with a new communication strategy, which is not only party's propaganda, but something more, a real strategy to guide the public debate. Of course, I'm not thinking that this is enough because there is a huge topic related to mainstream media. Because I think that also American history taught us how a very strong candidate like Sanders, while having against the whole mainstream media information, of course, people voted against Sanders because all television and broadcasts re kept repeating that the strongest candidate against Trump would have been Biden. And then as mainstream media, they really massacred Corbyn. That's literally what happened. So whoever asked this question is right. We as a radical left have a huge potential of leaves and hills that could be at our disposal. And I believe we need to invest more in this direction to organize the European creature, a left creature. Well, we are animalists, so I'm talking about beasts 
and animals and creatures, but at a European level, we need something that may go against not only Bannon, but the whole communication strategy of mainstream media. So I think that's an emergency. And if we don't do that, we would be blind. Because after what happened in the United States, after what happened in Italy, first the Five Star Movement, I wasn't mentioning that because it's falling now, but one of the reasons why the left disappeared in Italy is because even through a good use of communication, Italy is a country where a movement which can, cannot even be defined reached the 95% of consensus. So after that, after Bolsonaro, we should really learn a lesson. We cannot think that this is not a priority. So I really hope that all left parties in Europe will acknowledge this. And I think this shall be done at a European level. So whoever asked this question is right. The Bannon, Bannon's network is an international network. And I think we need to do something similar. Thank you for your answer. So right now we have no other questions. So if Walter and Roberto agree, I have a few questions that I prepared. Maybe I can ask one. Of course. Yes, please go ahead. So the first question is quite a national question but it could also be interesting for uh, Europe. So my question is, in the last week, we saw an initiative from some minor movements, such as the Communist Youth or the Communist Party of Workers and some other trade unions like Compass for a for a capitalist front. So what is your opinion on that? Do you have an opinion about for this party? Well, to be precise, the proposal of one anti-capitalist front came from one of the CICOBAS trade unions, which proposed open assemblies online, to which we were invited and which we participated. And of course, we accepted this cooperation field, which was very favorable for us, because we've always worked for unity. In Italy, we have a problem, the fragmentation of left-wing power is also true for social trade unions, so we're not able to create a united front which could comprehend all social and trade organizations. So we're working in every opportunity to work together. First, none of the spaces that we see is a reason to close a door other movements from the radical left. So our approach, can I say this in Spanish, Unidos Podemos, that means we can do it united. We have to make revolutions together, create movements together. And there's also another topic that we are focusing on and we've been focusing on with all of our partners. And that is that the current weakness of left-wing organizations in Italy, which comes from this fragmentation that I mentioned. I remember how the Foundation Party went through seven, eight, ten breakups in the last years. 
in which small parties were born, and of course they do not have huge consensus. If they did, I'd be happy for them, of course. So we need more little names together, but there are more names than actual people. We chose the topic. It's important to build social, political initiatives which have a real social antagonism to that is to give voice to societies and are not just a sum of different names. Otherwise, we're just unifying weaknesses. I think the current mobilization in Lombard is very positive, the one regarding health. Because even though it expressed on Saturday, you know, with revolutions and protests with similar goals, it still called on people to mobilitate on a very sensitive topic, that is, to fight against the pandemic. And how the region Lombardy managed the crisis and how the North League caused huge problems in East Nord. So working to unify all forces in order to avoid any closings. We need to rebuild a social and political coalition which is able to be as strong as we were when we brought hundreds of thousands of people in Genoa and then we occupied Italian squares repeatedly with protests which could not be cancelled by media because they were so big. They were huge. And now it's unthinkable to have something similar in Italy. No one is able to do that anymore. So we're really working to unite these forces and to cooperate with everyone. Of course, no one can say, you know, you're either with me or with that other person. Any alternative to the government and to the right wing is welcome. We're open to everyone and to collaborate with everyone. So we are about to launch a unification campaign with other left-wing parties, anti-capitalist parties, with opposition parties related to the public health system because it, it's necessary. And we're also working for the next administration and regional elections to have united list of radical left for all regions so that we only have one. Of course, there are opposing forces with different political approaches and they continue to uh, be autonomous at all costs. But we think it's great because the result will be that people We'll see that the left, the radical left, is not a strong and credible alternative to the Democratic Party, basically, and to the Five Star Movement. But our effort is still to be unified. Unity, unity, unity. Perfect. Thank you. So there is one more question in the box. I'll just read it. You mentioned some things, but I think it's good to repeat that neoliberalism won't be fought if we are still close in our countries. Other than fighting at home, what do you think would be the mottos and the fights that the left wing of Europe need to operate in Europe and to, to hear all European voices? Well, partially I already talked about this. One, I think we need to focus on the European Central Bank and we also need a perspective to change the European treaties, to modify the European architecture. And we do need some fundamental models to get out of the crisis that we are facing. There are some keywords that we need to focus on. 
and the tax haven are really another fundamental topic. And another important one is introducing a minimal hour salary in Europe to limit the salary dumping inside European countries. And I also think we need to have a European platform for peace. And especially for disarmament, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. But I'd like to remind you that we've never had such an international tension like the one we are experiencing today. And the industry of death is really something we are sadly investing on. And Europe is responsible for these crazy initiatives. And we need some traditions in Europe to focus on. Not only the tradition of the left wing and the communist and socialist movements, the workers' movements, and social democrats like Brandt and the effort for the dissension. But we also have a Catholic culture which also brings some ideas of peace and solidarity. And I think this should be something to really take into account. Because all these wars that we are involved in are also producing factors of migration upon which the right wing is building its propaganda. So after the workers' movement in Europe, we asked for peace, for bread, for a job, for health, for everyone, for education. Now we need to build something similar, and I think the European left is something that already has this platform. But the problem is that we are talking about this platform in single European platforms. And in European initiatives, we have common keyword. What we are lacking is the ability to build effective common campaigns. In the same day, in the same week, in all European countries, we should talk about the same things. We should focus upon the same emergencies by also proposing our own agenda. I mentioned these because in the 80s, we had a great movement at the European level. That is the one against the installation of the Euromiss And In all capitals of Europe at the same time, in every capital, there were hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the squares to demand the disarmament. Say no to nuclear missiles. I think we need, to, we need to do the same thing to mention some social words that unify European people that can be followed both on a national territory and also on a broader dimension at a European level. So once again, I repeat, we need resources to tackle the crisis, we need minimum salaries, and I think that's essential, especially regarding a European minimum income, because we're playing between the inequalities between countries and the differences. We are facing a competition that's feeding nationalism and that's hurting people. And we need to fight against tax havens. That's also very important. And then we have another essential topic, and that is the environmental issue, which also strengthens our point of view. It is evident that to go against the destruction of ecosystems and to promote an environmental change, we cannot only distribute money to enterprises, we need rules that target economy in a different direction. And from this point of view, since we're talking about something that involves 
everyone. We need some common instruction. And that's what's already going on with the Friday for Future movements that relaunch environmental topics. They became unpopular lately in Europe. Now they are alive again. And now it's a new dimension of discussion that's involving the whole society. I think we do have a possibility to invest on campaigns that identify needs and priorities that unify European peoples and to express their own needs. So the topic is also connected to the previous question. How are we able to build an efficient synergy between all social movements and parties in Europe to construct and to create an efficient left, which is European. Right now, we're just the sum of parties consulting each other, discussing together with parliamentary groups. Of course, we are proposing together, but then everyone acts in their own national space. What we need, even though this national space is important, is to increase our strength and capitalism reorganized itself, we need to do the same. We need to act on the European space. Not only when the time comes, for example, for the election. But of course, on that occasion, we present, you know, some parties and some initiative. We present a common program. But that program should be something that becomes our guideline 30, 365 days a year, sorry. And we need to do that at the European Parliament. We have a unitary group and we can identify some common battles. Yesterday there was a petition on vaccines shared by different parties at the European level. And that's just an example that can be applied for many other situations. There's another initiative that we just launched for a plan from the European Central Bank to direct investments. So I think this is the way we need to act and we need to apply and to strengthen, to avoid the current monopolization of the public debate from the government. Very few governments are representing a left-wing point of view in Europe. And we need to reorganize those who do not recognize themselves in their government's policy. And I think that's a very difficult task, but somehow it's still exciting. And it would be great if we were able to make it real. And now, more than ever, we have the right conditions to do that. The strongest point in our history was when we create movements in all of Europe next to Greece. Unfortunately, we were defeated. But that moment was important. It would be a mistake to go back. We weren't able to develop a real pressure to break pressure of Tsipras government. I think we need to try it again and to make this practice real and common, something to implement. I'll say it again. The worker movement was refounded the day that the strikes were launched in France. We should do that. We should do the same at least for one minute every day in Europe. We need some common goals that are the ones of socialists and communists <laughs> in our continent. It's a tradition which doesn't always only talk about horrible mistakes that we made, but there are also great experiences of solidarity and common fights that we need to reapply. And this also goes for the question of Walter regarding the right wing. 
I remember that anti-fascism and the resistance were a European phenomenon, which started from a military point of view in Spain with volunteers leaving for all of Europe. And today, I think this right-wing wave in Europe and this racism movement can be destroyed if the real European left will act on the European field. I can. I think I'll give the floor to Walter for the conclusions since time is up. Yeah, no conclusions, but winding up uh, by saying uh, thank you, Maurizio, for this interesting conversation, which provided us also with insights into the domestic politics uh, of Italy. Of course, thank you, Roberto and Giuseppe, uh, co-moderating. Thank you for all of our, for all of you who followed uh, this event and contributed uh, with your questions. Especially, I want to thank our interpreter, Francesca Salzano, and as usual, Angelina Giannopoulou, who managed the event uh, behind the scenes. Of course, the, in, the interview is uh, recorded and will be put on our website. And uh, let me indicate that the 10th edition of our series, Meeting the Left, will be with Wojtech Philipp, who is the chairman of the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia. He's also vice president of the Parliament of the Czech uh, Republic. Uh, that interview will be broadcasted on Thursday, 1st of July at uh, 6 p.m. as usually. You can already register for this event with the link shown in the chat or on the Transform website. And having said this, I wish you all a nice evening and we hope fully see each other soon at the next webinar. Goodbye. See you later. Goodbye, everyone. See you bye soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Francesca.